All right, everybody, this is Ross. Welcome back uh, to another episode of Fruit Talk. Thank you guys once again for joining me in this week's episode. Um, we have a, an episode tonight that's going to be kind of all over the place. Uh, a number of different topics. We're going to talk about one, persimmons. It's uh, persimmon season. And I actually just got some persimmons sent to me by a viewer. Uh, really appreciative of that. And in fact, they were some Hychia persimmons. And what we're going to do is I'm actually going to be drying them once again this year into Hoshigaki. And my plans is to actually to go to a Korean market um, about 30-ish, 40 minutes minutes from me. And I'm going to buy a bunch of persimmons, a bunch of uh, Hychia persimmons. And hopefully this is the last year I ever have to do something like that. But um, dried persimmon, a.k.a. Hoshigaki, I guess you could you could call them, is uh, one of the best fruits on the planet. And we'll get into all that in a second. But we're also going to talk about um, figs. We're going to talk about the um, fact that I'm sort of moving away from growing in containers and growing the majority, if not all, of my figs in the ground and, and why that is. And just touching on that, because we've, we've talked about that before and we've mentioned it many times now, um, that I just truly believe that uh, growing figs in containers is basically an obsolete practice and should not be done unless you have no other choice but to grow figs in containers. Um, if you just cannot plant, let's say, a tree in the ground and you're forced to grow them in a container, then um, obviously I think that'd be the one situation. But even for people in like zone four, I don't really recommend it. And I'll get into all that why why that is and some things that we've been learning um, and kind of expanding our thinking on this a little bit further. Uh, we're also going to touch on my health very briefly. Um, we've just had, again, some more health realizations um, about myself and just in general. And we, we talked about um, in last week's episode how I stopped eating gluten and I stopped eating dairy and actually how great I've been feeling. Um, we're going to touch a little bit more on that. And then also, I, what I want to start off with is the fact that we had a sale recently. Um, we've been selling our fig trees on FigBid for anyone that's interested. I know um, I get this question all year. It doesn't matter what time of the year it is. It's from every single person. Um, I even try to have an automated message for people that, that ask me on Facebook. If I could do it on Instagram or email, I would. Um, but... Yeah, there there's an automated uh, answer telling people exactly how to buy the fig trees or fig cuttings from me and what the deal is with that. Um, but we finally have some for sale, and I announced it on Fig Boss, my blog, also on Facebook and Instagram. We did a little video on YouTube that somehow got a ton of viewers, a um, ton of views. I don't know why that is, but... We had a number of bare-rooted trees for sale. Actually, we sold 50. We, we had 51 for sale, and I sold 50, I sold 40, 47 in a matter of probably less than 48 hours. Um, it, it's been insane. Actually, probably in a matter of 48 hours, I think, ex exactly how, how long it's been. Um, so we had this sale that happened super quick. I've been working my butt off outside. Today was extremely windy. Uh, we'll get into that in, in a little bit as well because I want to talk about the frost that came in. We just had our first frost of the year. And essentially, um, you know, the sale, like I said, the sale has been crazy and I, I've been working my butt off to get every everyone's trees bare rooted and I I spent uh, the f all day yesterday um, packing up the trees and the day prior on Saturday. Um, I think it was, yeah, Saturday was Halloween. So I spent all day on Saturday outside, and you can actually see a photo of me here with uh, one of the bare-rooted trees I bare-rooted. This is actually a Calderwood. That's a very vigorous variety, 
and also this was in a 10 a 15 gallon size pot for three years so this is kind of what a root system looks like after three years and this is kind of what you could expect from a tree of that vigor and and age um, from a similarly sized pot so these trees have got some pretty darn good root systems on them obviously some more than others and I tried my best to kind of give you guys an idea of how big the root systems would be um, but essentially what we do is uh, take off all the soil you can see I have a my cart here of soil as I shake it all off and you know rub it all off it's different techniques for each tree because unusually some of the trees that I've either got from friends or I, I purchased in the past they really haven't used the best soil um, and if they're really really well rooted in their pots it's more difficult to get the soil off but depending on what the soil composition is I find that it's way more difficult um, to get the soil off and I actually just shake my head you know at some of the people that I've gotten trees from in the past because some of the soil has just been crap I, I really think perlite and um, peat moss and sand are just some of the worst things you can use and it really has been proven not just in the bare rooting process of like actually bare rooting them and the ease of doing that but the, just the simple fact that you get to really evaluate the root systems of these trees because I literally just took well I didn't take 50 trees out of their pots just yet I would say I probably took about 20 out of their pots on Saturday and then I inspected the root system I mean it doesn't get any better inspecting the root system than taking off all of the soil and seeing what the deal is and without a doubt the trees that I use my soil conditioner on have the best root system by far um, it's not even close so uh, it's a good um, you know uh, confirmation I guess in a sense of anecdotal information and not only that but I've done this last year too you know so I have not just 20 trees I've looked at but let's say I think last year I did probably around 30 to maybe even 35 so I've probably looked at this point at least 50 trees that are bare rooted I've done more than that actually over the years but but the point is is that uh, yeah it, it, that was something I learned and I thought was interesting about this whole thing um, but what I'm gonna do for anyone that actually bought some of these trees I shipped out this morning um, eight packages I probably have another uh, I don't know probably about another 10 orders to fulfill and there's gonna be obviously more than 10 packages but uh, we have about roughly another 30 trees to bear root so I, I imagine tomorrow what my plan is I'm gonna be digging up trees that I planted in the ground and bare rooting them and then planting trees in their place that um, I want to get out of my pots because I have a number of trees in pots like I said that I'm trying to get away from either by selling them to you guys and getting rid of them or by actually just planting them in the ground and I've even gone as far as actually planting like grafted varieties in the ground um, so even regardless if they're on their own roots if they're grafted if they're hardy if they're not hardy it doesn't matter um, if it's a variety that I see a lot of potential in I'm gonna put that tree in the ground and that's sort of what I did I've been making a nice list here of trees that I can even kind of go into at some point in the future but these are the trees here that I have an intention of, uh, of planting and probably will get around to about this many um, yeah probably about this many tomorrow maybe I'll do these but the process of digging all these up and planting them all is going to take some time and then what my plan is uh, actually the following day on Wednesday is to then because today is Monday um, sorry to you know film this on a different day other than other than Monday or Wednesday but um Wednesday I'm going to when this video airs I'm going to uh, pack up all of the plants I bare rooted um, make sure that they're obviously moist the roots are not drying out put them in boxes and um, potentially even ship some out that day um, 
so that I can get them out to people. And then on Thursday, it's once again bare rooting the remainder of the trees that are in pots that need to be bare rooted. And then on Friday, I will do that whole packaging process again and then head to the post office probably on Saturday um, and finish this whole thing off. Um, maybe I'll wait till Monday. I don't know. But the point is is that this this has been a lot of work, and um, it's been totally worth it. Don't get me wrong. But um, it's you know that's just a breakdown, I guess, of what my days have been like um, throughout this process. Um, you know, it's basically one day of bare rooting, outside all day and I get about 20 trees done um, and then the next day I package them all up and that's another day of just packaging them you know this this whole thing takes <laughs> it takes, takes time I, I spent about four or five hours packaging the trees getting them into the boxes getting them wrapped in newspaper and, and bagged up and making sure everything was right and situated and getting the postage on the boxes. Um, another thing I learned about this process is that, as I said, there is different methods of bare rooting them. Um, some trees, you just need to really try to put a lot of weight on the soil um, to kind of break apart some of those really fine roots that's kind of containing a lot of the soil. Other trees, I found I had no choice but to get my hose out and start hosing the thing down. Other trees with the right soil, as I said, the soil conditioner I use, it just comes sort of right off. Um, you can get the tree out of that soil in no time. But the smaller the tree is, if it's in a five gallon size pot, it's very, very easy. It takes a lot less time. And then I end up just basically, once I get some soil loose and I get the thing loosened up a bit, it's all just really about shaking the tree and using my hand to, to really, I probably shake it with one hand, hold it by the, the, uh, the trunk there and then shake it. And then as I'm shaking and I'm rubbing the soil with what with the other hand. And, uh, if I do that, it, it doesn't take as much time, um, as you might think, but, um, some trees are really, <laughs> really annoying. Um, yeah, it, anyway, so that's, that's sort of what's been going on. And I, I only have four trees left. For anyone that's interested, um, actually, I think I have maybe two more that I'm going to do because I have extras. I have two copies of the Neger de Agde and then also another Raven de Calci. So I have a total of six more potentially. But if they don't sell, it's not the end of the world. I'll, they're going to remain listed all the way till the spring, and I'll ship them out in the spring. You know, um, I don't mind overwintering them. I don't have any issue with that um, because we're just going to have so many less trees, so many less pots this year that I'm going to have so much space in that greenhouse that it's kind of, uh, it's going to be crazy actually what I'm going to be able to do in terms of seed starting or anything else I want to do in that greenhouse because I just got a ton of room in there. I don't know. Maybe I'll even do some rooting in there. I don't know. That might be a little too much, the rooting. Probably probably not a stable enough environment but anyway um yeah that's just something we'll do for the future and think about at some point um so yeah th that's sort of the end here of the sale and, and the last thing i want to mention about this is that we're going to have uh cuttings obviously for sale relatively soon uh, actually sooner than i thought i thought we we're going to wait probably till about mid um mid-november but I do think um, we're going to start actually listing some cuttings very, very soon on FigVid for anyone that's interested. Uh, we're not going to take a ton of cuttings. I'm not going to have a ton of varieties listed. We still need to have a couple more frosts before I do my major pruning. But I did do some minor pruning here and there. Um, and obviously, I'm going to be doing some pruning for myself um, of some more f maybe like cold sensitive wood that then I'm going to root myself and I'm going to um, start the rooting process actually very soon and we're going to start actually doing some um, not just the rooting process but also getting um, 
what is the word? Um, we're going to do some broccoli sprouts. And this sort of relates to health in a way is that um, broccoli sprouts and, you know, you can do like sunflower sprouts or um, bean sprouts of any kind or any sort of sprout that's edible. A lot of people use them as garnishes. They have nice texture. Uh, you can cook them up a little bit. You can just eat them, obviously, raw. Um, but broccoli sprouts has been one of those things that some people online and some doctors and, and researchers have really put a lot of attention towards because they have something in them called sulforaphane. And just in general, the whole cruciferous family of vegetables, in my opinion, is extremely powerful um, for your health. And I've also noticed that mushrooms are very, very powerful. And some of these drugs that you guys might take, synthetic medications that people are creating, um, they're quite powerful, but some of these things that are found in nature are just as powerful, if not more powerful. Um, I think, honestly, we're looking in the wrong place. I'm very, take a very, I take a very holistic approach, and I think a lot of you guys listening probably do as well, and there's a pretty darn good reason for that. Um, because if you are in tune with nature, as probably most of you are, if you grow food of any kind, you understand nature. You understand what's going on with all these different varieties and the genetics and plants. Just if you understand plants, it's pretty freaking hard not to understand that um, nature is incredible, you know, and all the amazingness of nature is just so difficult to replicate synthetically that it's just hard to beat you know it really is hard to beat so things like for me i really love uh, turmeric and black pepper as an anti-inflammatory and that has been my replacement if i ever need something like advil or ibuprofen you know ibuprofen destroys your stomach so creates all kinds of stomach acids so you you know and, and reflux so you just there's alternatives to most of these things in nature and i yeah i mean that whole save the rainforest thing is like it's true you know you just don't know what the what is in the rainforest that could potentially be extremely beneficial to our health and um yeah the fact that a lot of people a lot of big companies i should say are destroying fields to they're clearing fields to then plant things like you know for palm oil and canola oil and all these really destructive oils in our body that actually create inflammation and are cheap but they're extremely harmful to health and also to the populations that these corporations take the land from i mean there's i could just go on and on about this but um, the point is, is that I, I do find that cruciferous vegetables are extremely beneficial and, um, you know, even just eating them. Uh, but apparently if you consume them as a, a sprout, a broccoli sprout, um, shortly after sprouting the seed and they get to a certain height, a certain maturity, I guess, maybe even, um, I don't even know, actually, I have to put some research into it cause I've never done, um, I've never done, uh, what even is the word? Uh, I forget, I'm blanking on the word here, guys, but it's essentially, um, <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about, where you grow these uh, these bean sprouts underneath lights and things like that. Holy crap. But the, the point is, is that I don't even know at what stage you would do the harvest, but the point is, is that those sprouts have an extremely high amount of nutrients in them. Uh, there's a lot of energy in these seeds, and um, once that energy is released, it's extremely nutritious. Unfortunately, there is arguments people can make about um, just the sustainability of seeds, but I would argue that you know seeds in general are just they're they're not easy, they're not difficult to come by. You know what I mean? Like if you ever get some carrots that go to seed, you'll you'll understand. You know, you get some fennel that goes to seed, you're gonna you're going to have more seed than you ever know what to do with. So uh, I'm not personally too wary. Maybe there is some seed that's not sustainable, but uh, I'm I'm not too worried about it. But the, the point is, is that, you know, um, 
sulforaphane is the chemical within it that is anti-cancerous and anti-inflammatory and just extremely good for your health and um i personally find that uh cruciferous vegetables are really good for kind of detoxifying your body um as i think i've read this as well that they have something in in uh, cruciferous vegetables i think i think glutathione is in um glutathione I believe is in cruciferous vegetables, but I could be lying about that. You know, cruciferous vegetables include broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, some of the richest food sources of glutathione, which is honest. It's really referred to as the strongest antioxidant. I mean, it really is like a super antioxidant. So no wonder I feel good after eating them, you know, and glutathione is said, and you can, here's even a study here, is about basically uh, detoxifying your body is really what glutathione does. It really helps detoxify your body and with all these different things that I guess are in, you know, modern, modern day and age, whether that's pollution or um, plastics or anything that's bothering us. Um, it's really nice to have something that's detoxifying your body. And, you know, I, I do think um, for other reasons as well, these cruciferous vegetables are extremely important too. Uh, there's something in them called uh, uh, dim, which people talk about a lot, and um, how that relates to your hormones, um, whether that's estrogen. And I think there's also something else in cruciferous vegetables which... I don't remember the name of it, but I think there's something testosterone cruciferous vegetables. I believe there's something in it that also helps with just your testosterone. Yeah, okay, so that's what it does. I guess that's, I don't know how accurate this statement is, but it helps you with, with your testosterone because it lowers your estrogen, and especially to, to specific women, too much estrogen can be... Um, very detrimental to your health it could be i think even toxic if i'm not mistaken so yeah uh i don't know i found the whole cruciferous vegetable thing extremely extremely important and i eat a ton of them um obviously for good reason i think they're amazing i think they taste so good um but i also find myself in a way craving them when i'm not really feeling all that good so I, I, uh, I'm just a big proponent of them anyway. So that's something that we're going to do. And, um, man, what was the thing I actually did want to talk about in terms of my health? Cause this is something I actually think I wanted, I wanted to mention. Um, maybe if it comes to me, I'll, I'll bring it up. Um, but in terms of the gluten and the dairy, I've st still stopped and I still feel so, so good off of it. Um, Yeah, and I I, th I think actually just to expand on that a little bit, maybe I mentioned this before, but I could probably list like 10 different things that I feel better on, feel better about, or 10 different ways I feel better <laughs> um, by not eating, because I'm not eating gluten or dairy. At least it seems like that's the reason, right? Um, anyway, so continuing on... Um, away from health now and back to figs for a moment because we actually did have a, a frost that came in our first frost and we, we didn't really touch on this but i wanted to um this is what the fig trees look like after a frost and i wanted to post this actually on the blog and talk about this and some people i saw some li a little bit of this on facebook and people were concerned and all that but Again, this is what they should look like after a frost. This is what the process is. This is how it goes. And, you know, some of these leaves here that have crimpled up like this and are turning brown very soon, a lot of those are going to start falling off. But what really will help them go into dormancy is another frost. So another light frost is really going to just send them dormant. And then you have to wait about a week 
or so after that. Maybe you get another frost afterwards, but something a week after they drop all their leaves, the sap flow will kind of return back down into the roots, and that's when we do do our pruning. So, yeah, there's a little visual there of kind of what it is that I think we should be really focused on at this time of the year in terms of our frost-sensitive plants. Um, and we, we are going back to figs anyway because we're going to talk now about, you know, why I'm moving away from growing figs in containers. Um, just in general, I would just argue that if you can grow something in the ground, you're going to be way better off. You know, I mean, there's just nothing that you can honestly do that is going to make the soil or the conditions the same as if it was in the ground, you know. Um, maybe you can have a super, supercharged soil and in, in a pot, and you could probably get close to the nutrients and the qualities that are in the soil, but you're still constricted. You still have a, a, a constricted root system in a pot, and it's just not something that you necessarily want to do. Um, I think there's just immense benefits of growing any fruit tree in the ground. And if I could grow my pomegranates in the ground, I would. Um, you know, if I could grow all my fruit trees in the ground, I would. Really, the only thing that's sort of left is the pomegranates. And if they're not going to be producing nearly as much fruit as I am hoping they will, then they're going to be phased out as well. Uh, actually, one thing that is super awesome in containers is actually the citrus trees. And I probably, what I'm going to end up doing now that I'm really thinking about this, man, it's amazing. You know, once you free up some space in your patio, <laughs> don't have a whole lot of room, it's like, oh, well, what should I grow, you know, in its place? Or you kind of get all these ideas flowing. And certainly citrus trees, I figured it out to a T, basically. Um, and we are going to be growing, I think, a lot more citrus trees in containers. Well, uh, now that I say that, I don't know, actually, because do I have enough places in the house for these things? I'm not sure. You know, I have a citrus tree, actually, that I moved in because of the frost. you got to take them out of the frost. And this guy right right next to me here on my right is huge. It's my biggest citrus tree. But in all honesty, um, you know, it's it's not really in a sunny spot. This is my, the north side of my house. This is west, straight ahead of me. So the west windows are great, but I don't even keep my west windows open. I'm going to have to open them up, but... For the most part, my room is a very, very shady side and corner of the house because this is north, and north doesn't get a whole lot of light. So I have to wait till the afternoon really to get any light at all. And if I have these citrus trees here in a window that's north-facing, it's just not going to be that great. Um, it's not the end of the world, but... And you know what? I could probably get away with putting them somewhere, let's say, like in the basement without any light, uh, assuming I don't overwater them. Maybe they do drop some leaves. you got to watch out for some pests like scale and spider mites. But I probably could just keep a bunch of these trees somewhere, even if they're not really in a ton of light, and keep them like that. You know, this is where... Th this particular tree i think was last year it wasn't like it wasn't there actually this the entire year last year it was in this west window i think so we may struggle with this tree i guess this will be a good test um and it is a very strong and healthy tree so if it struggles then that kind of gives me the idea that i can or cannot do this can i can or cannot have more citrus trees and um yeah, I don't have a whole lot of west or southern windows in this house to occupy, to put these trees in. Um, it would be nice, but they make great house plants, I'll tell you that. So right now, that that thing's beautiful, and uh, it really is adding a nice feng shui to my, my bedroom. Um, 
but yeah, wh- wh- what are we even talking about here, guys? We're going back to figs. Uh, so the 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 w- reason I'm moving away from the containers again is that they're obsolete, and the reason they're obsolete is because I've really developed a whole new method. There was it wasn't like this was my own original idea. I I would like to think this whole growing method in itself is my own idea. But obviously, growing figs under low tunnels was not, it's not, well, there was there is a guy who grows figs under low tunnels as a form of winter protection. Um, he doesn't actually grow them in the spring to grow them and to give them a, a head start to the season. Uh, as far as I know, he was only doing it for winter protection purposes. Um there are other people, obviously, who have mentioned using low tunnels in the past, but uh, definitely putting this all together, all these little pieces together into one methodology, I think I can say is my own. Um, so what we're we're certainly doing different than anybody else is having a very, very dense spacing, two-foot spacing that, that literally nobody else is doing. The closest spacing I've heard of before planting my fig trees this close was actually four feet. And I've been trialing, as you guys know, different spacings and whatnot to see how close I could, in fact, plant them. And this year we really got an idea of what the limits are. And it really comes down to the amount of fruiting branches you allow each tree to have. So what I've actually come up with and we've talked about before is actually this little diagram here that I created where this gives you four different styles of plantings, four different spacings. This is a to- this is here using a cordon cordon system. Excuse me. Essentially each green box first off, each box is 1 square foot, each green box is a fruiting branch. Each red box is where a tree is located. And also, um, these red boxes here also represent a fruiting branch, unless, of course, we're talking about these cordons, um, because these cordons have a row, basically, of the actual cordon itself, and you need to have space for that itself um, for the actual structure of the tree. So that's kind of why on just the cordons, there's such a long row of, uh, of these red boxes. But essentially, I did this whole diagram here for one purpose, was to figure out what is the most optimal spacing, the most optimal methodology to be growing figs underneath my low tunnels. And here, I guess, is the whole idea behind the low tunnels just really quickly is that Because they're so closely spaced, what this allows you to do is a couple things. So we'll get into this these diff- this diagram here in a minute. But because they're so close together, this is what you can do: is that you can cut them all back to six to twelve inches off the ground. By cutting them back every fall after we get a, another frost or two, by doing that every year, um you're essentially restarting from a very low height. And because your trees are now very low in height, they're easy to protect in the wintertime. For anybody out there who needs to protect their trees in the wintertime, this is extremely, extremely important for growing figs in colder climates. And this, of course, allows you to use a particular method called the cut and cover method, where essentially we cut them all back very low, um, you can even do this with a low cordon. You could protect a low cordon this way. Um, that's, let's say, 6 to 12 inches off the ground. You cover the cordon. You cover the trees, the branches, with straw or some sort of insulative material. You can even use you know, insulation from your home, a huge array of different materials that you want that is just has easy access to you. Then you cover that with tarps. Um, you can even use concrete blankets. It's probably even better. Um, you can cover them with really just any insulative material because the ground is a heat source and you just have to insulate that. 
and that keeps the trees warm and um, away from any damage whatsoever. And you could do that, guys. If you can insulate the ground really well, you can do this method even in zone four. So that's really, I think, one advantage. The second advantage is that because you cut them so low, you then can treat them like they're a crop that you can grow under a low tunnel. And some of the crops that normally farmers and people use and grow under low tunnels is things like lettuces, um, carrots, anything that's really low to the ground that doesn't get very tall. And then that gives them some season extension. You know, particularly these are probably things that are your spring crops, your your fall crops, any sort of season extension throughout the year. And then if you wanted higher crops, taller crops, then you would use something like a high tunnel. But the figs now are then reduced to such a low height that you can grow them underneath low tunnels for a long enough period of time in the spring that gives them a huge benefit um, so if anybody is in a short seasoned climate um, anyone in probably some zone eights believe it or not there's people like you guys in the pacific northwest that need to get every ounce of heat that you can get people in the pacific northwest um, all the way down to people in zone fours you're going to really benefit with a huge jump start to the season with the help of this plastic it really warms up the soil it gets them awake, and then therefore they're producing uh, figs way earlier than you would expect. Um, so I can get into whole kinds of details about this, but essentially this little diagram here I think really explains it as well, pretty well, which is the fact that it's very dense, and not only um, am I growing a lot of figs underneath these tunnels, so it saves space. It's really efficient on time uh, because these protection methods and the, all these different methods are extremely benef or ex extremely efficient. But I think it's also really cost efficient, as I said down here. And someone I replied to uh, to Tony here. It's again, it's very cost, space, and time time effic efficient. Jeez. and also it's reliable. And you're getting essentially uh, a ton of figs. Um. And you're also getting them at a very early date. So you're getting a lot of figs. You're getting them at an early date. It's also very efficient. And it's also very reliable. And therefore, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to be growing figs in containers. It just, it just doesn't. And that's sort of where I'm at. Is, uh, we're moving away from this and using that in-ground system of methodology. And people have been really replying to this thread here on our figs. And it was kind of incredible to me how clueless people were on this because I thought I've been explaining this pretty darn well over the last, you know, nine months or so at this point. I think I've been talking about this actually maybe for a whole year. So I thought people really understood this and I even created a couple threads about it and tried to get people to start doing this kind of thing. Uh, people had all kinds of weird questions and things that just made me think, wow, these people really have no clue about this whole idea and it's really then worth talking about more so that's why i'm mentioning it mentioning it here in this episode and kind of wanted to expand on it a little bit and uh it really is just one of the best fruit trees you can grow underneath a low tunnel because if you think about any of the low tunnels or any of the fruit trees that you can grow what fruit tree can you grow where you can cut the whole thing back to 6 to 12 inches and it'll fruit the following season? That's, in my opinion, why figs are so darn incredible. That's like the one big reason right there that separates figs from almost any other fruit tree that you can think of. I mean, so many other fruit trees need either fruiting buds that form in the fall, um, sort of like a brava. They need spurs. They need um, growth tips. Um... They need one-year-old, some of them do form on one-year-old wood, but a lot of times the growth on that one-year-old wood has to come from growth from last year. So it's, it's, or I should say, I should change my statement. Something like a mulberry, let's take as an example. You have to, um, it'll only fruit on one-year-old wood. So like last year's growth, 
uh, the peach will only fruit on last year's growth. So if you cut off all of last year's growth, like you would a fig, you're not getting anything. The fig, however, fruits on new growth. So it's incredible in that sense. And uh, I don't think there's any other fruit tree I can think of that's like it for that reason. Um, and to me, it just allows you to do some really incredible stuff. Now, if I had the space, in all honesty, I'd be growing them underneath high tunnels. So, and it'd be 365 days out of the year. But having said that, all of this, any growing a fig underneath plastic in any form is far superior to growing them in a container. Um, even if you grow them in a container under plastic, plastic's better than no plastic. So, um, I'd rather. <laughs> I'd rather be growing these figs definitely under plastic regardless. So that I think is really what I wanted to mention here in this little thing. And, you know, I've done so many videos now on the low tunnels themselves, the construction, taking them down. Um, I've talked about how easy that is. It really is so, so stupidly easy to, to create them, to set them up, to take them down. Um, once you get the hang of it, it's a joke. Those go up sometime in March. Once they go up in March, then it takes about 15 days, probably about March 15th for them to wake up. Um, and I would imagine about July 15th, I think is a conservative estimate, that they actually have fruit on them. Some other things we have to worry about is the amount of fruiting branches we allow them to have, which is essentially why I did this diagram. You don't want them too dense. And this two-foot spacing here I have is probably the best spacing that I can think of uh, because you're giving each fruiting branch one square foot which is extremely important because if you space them too close and there's too dense you just won't have the fruit set it just will not form I learned that this year and um, so if you limit them each of these trees essentially each tree is then limited to four fruiting branches spaced two feet on center three rows you then limit them to four fruiting branches and they fruit all up and down those four fruiting branches. Really, um, you probably will get, I imagine, probably, I I think is a, a conservative estimate is about 15 to 20. Um, I would say probably a conservative estimate in my climate, my location is probably 15 fruits per fruiting branch. So you get one tree is going to essentially put out 60 fruits um, per tree. And honestly, I think you probably can get that even higher, to be honest with you, because these trees are just going to continue to continue to grow, and they're going to continue to put out fruits. So it could be anywhere. It could probably be even 30 fruits per tree. I don't necessarily know. Uh, but I think conservative, you'd see 15. And, and what that means is you're basically, you need um, for every, I guess it would be for every four square feet of growing area, you're getting at least 60 fruits. Now, the big plus to this is that it's not just 60 fruits. It's 60 fruits at a ridiculously early date, um, way earlier than you could produce any fruit in a container um, if you didn't have plastic. So... I think it makes a whole lot of sense for anybody in um, zone four, zone five, zone seven, zone six, zone eight. Some people in zone eights, it would just be extremely beneficial for uh, for a lot of people, and it would just completely make growing in containers obsolete. So the then the last thing here we want to talk about in this episode here, guys, is actually persimmons, and uh, like I said, it's persimmon season. This is what my tree I wish looked like. Uh, this is a beautiful, looks like a, looks like a hychia or something. But uh, I wish my tree was loaded like this, and it should be loaded like this. My Rosianca persimmon is massive. Um, I wish I could talk more about these trees, but I'm just waiting for more experience, right? Got to get the fruits. Got to be able to evaluate these trees more. What my plan is to do, because uh, I have about nine or ten of them, or eight persimmon trees at this point, I'm going to actually graft another one this year, but my plan is to uh, 
really focus on opening up the trees, opening up the center. I kind of feel like they're similar in a way to figs in that they they really need some good light penetration into that canopy. I think that would sort of really help. So I'm going to open up the center, and that's kind of where I got the idea from is from this book. is uh, Persimmons. It's uh, Persimmon Culture in New Zealand is the name of the book. And this is like the Bible, apparently, the most information that you can find on persimmons. There's not really a whole lot of information. Here's actually some information I learned about in Japan. This is at the uh, Emperor's Garden, at the Emperor's Palace. So that's pretty interesting. Um, anyway, so... What we're doing with the persimmons, though, is that I'm going to go out because I don't have any, unfortunately. My trees produced zero. I think the frost had something to do with that. We had a late frost. I'm sure you guys are aware of that. I think that was part of the problem, but also my rosianca persimmon just dropped a ton of fruit, and that's really a big shame. Um, I really wish I could solve this dropping problem. I wish there, I knew the reason for it because it's really quite annoying. Um, you know, my Rosianca now is five, I think this is its fifth year. So it's going to be six years old in its sixth season next year. And if it doesn't fruit, I'm going to be really, really upset. But we're going to go out and we're going to buy some <laughs> persimmons. And then we're going to make them into Hoshigaki, which um, we've talked in, in great length, actually, on an episode of Fruit Talk um on this podcast so it's essentially just a dried persimmon with a really awesome gooey inside and the outside gets um that dried persimmon texture that you might think of and this is probably the hmm this is a decent photo not really um i don't know where my photos are but the inside's nice and gooey and jammy, whereas the outside has got that really awesome dried persimmon texture. That's kind of like a pear in a way, or like a like a pancake. It's kind of strange, but um, yeah, it's it's really sweet. Um, they're probably my favorite fruit because of this. If you can get them in this state, and the best fruits to do it with is these haichias. For sure, these big acorn-shaped fruits are, make the best because they're not, in my mind, they're not really the best persimmon when eaten fresh. I'm sorry to say. And a lot of these astringent-type persimmons get a bad rap, I think, because of the Hychia persimmon. Um, these, I just believe, truly, are meant for drying. They're not really a fresh-eating persimmon, personally. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's someone in California that gets them really tasty, but they're just not that complex to me. And they make unbelievably sweet fruits that, in my opinion, are better than even something like dates. And dates, I would argue, are my favorite dried fruit. And these are some of the best dates I've ever found. It's uh, called Delilah. And they are um, Israeli dates that I'm not kidding. I think when I went to Israel, this is what I carried around with me as a snack because they're just so darn good. They're incredibly good. These are the highest class dates that they have. They are unreal how good these are, these Majul dates. Um, I'll tell you why. I'm going to open them up. I think I could go for a date right now, right? More, more, more than one date. You know what I mean. Um, let's get these guys out of here. So they're they're incredibly moist, and a lot of the dates you guys buy at the store. What happens is they pit them, they take the pits out, and they dry them to like a crazy amount of dryness, which is just stupid because when you dry them so much you lose all that flavor and texture the best part of these dates is that they are creamy and moist and there's a part actually right 
when you split them in half, there's a part like right in here and also on the other side that's really uh, creamy. And you can honestly break it apart away from the rest of the date. That part's really moist. And I don't necessarily prefer it nearly as much. Because then what's left on the bottom is actually really awesome. Which has got a really chewy, jammy texture to it. Um, which has even got in certain certain dates that you can find in this box that are have like a, a crunch in a way to them. Because they have like a... Um, hmm. They have like something similar you would find in the pear or a persimmon where they have um uh it's it's gritty um what is the word um they have all these little small little pieces in them and as the as the date dries those little individual pieces i guess of the date crystallize and become sort of crunchy and it adds so much texture this is really, in my opinion, was the best dried fruit that you could eat. But I would argue that the Hoshigaki is even better. Now, got one other thing here, which rivals the both of them, is the dried fig. Of course, right? These actually here I bought. These are from uh, Costco. They're dried Smyrna figs. This is the Calamirna variety. And these are not all that expensive for how many you get. And this is really your a true dried fig. You know, this is like got the cork tints on it. The honey has solidified at the eye. The inside has a ton of seeds in it. And these are really good because they have still, they still have some moisture on the inside. The problem is with some of these fruits, these dried fruits with moisture on the inside, even the date is that they can get moldy if they don't have enough sugar content. So what a lot of people do is they, a lot of these commercial um, producers, I guess, they dry them to an extreme amount that sucks out all the moisture for the most part. I think you need to get them to like 80% moist or something. These, I would imagine, are probably sun-dried. Um, hmm. I don't know. I think they add something to them to help preserve them. It just says organic dried figs. Uh, these are Turkish, by the way. Yeah, that's all it says. Hmm. So I don't even think they have anything on them, which some of figs you can find uh, will have a coating on them that is like a preservative that is really not <clears throat> very tasty <laughs> and probably not that good for your health. But um, if you get the right amount of bricks in these fruits, they dry so well and they last for a long time. So you end up having the fig and the date, even though they're moist, and that moisture is still getting you the right texture and the right flavor, okay? As soon as you suck out all that moisture, you ruin it. And you need to retain a certain amount of moisture, even with your own figs. It doesn't matter if you're drying them yourself or if you buy them. Same thing with this Hoshigaki here. You don't want to dry them all the way. And there's a photo here I saw of one. Some of these probably even are dried all the way. You don't want to do that. You want the inside of these persimmons to be nice and gooey. And you will be in heaven. Um, what some people do is they dry, they dry the fuyu's whole, and then they freeze them. And personally, I just don't think they're any good like that. I mean, they're good, but they're not anywhere near as good as these because they become gooey on the inside, whereas the dried, the fully dried ones and then frozen, just. Ugh, they, they they lose all that and instead they're kind of like eating a pancake uh, 
a pear slash pancake. It's so strange. Anyway, so that's sort of what we're doing here, guys. It really is so simple with these fruits is just get them to the right moisture content, whether you're drying them in a dehydrator, you're sun drying them. Um, what I'm going to do with my persimmons is I'm going to string them up. Actually, I'm not even going to string them up. I'm going to just lay them out on trays and keep them in a, uh, a room with the fan on. A dry environment and the fans running 24-7. About 20 to 30 days in, they're done. You can put them into whatever you want, package them up, and you can have dried fruit like this all winter time. Um, I'm telling you... They make like the best dessert. You don't need anything. You don't need any dessert. This is it right here. This is nature's dessert. Um, it almost can't, you really can't get better than this in some situations. So, um, I will say in terms of these dried figs, they're quite good. You could see how brown that is in there with the calamurna. And it's nice and juicy and moist. I would argue that this is some of the best dried figs you can buy. But mine are still better, believe it or not. The one thing these guys have is the fact that they're crunchy. They have a lot of seeds. The reason they have so much seeds is because they've been pollinated by the wasp. That's one huge benefit. However, it is of the Calamurna variety. These are just very figgy flavored. The, the figs you can grow at home um, will have way more intense flavors to them. Um, that will blow this out of the water. We'll probably even blow these dates out of the water. And we'll probably compete, in my mind, for top spot with the Hoshigaki for dried fruit. So if I could dry the berry figs, let's say, that would also retain a lot of that figginess in it. Oh, man. It'd be so, so good. Um, I envy you guys in California. And I'll leave you with one other thing. There's a date that y'all you should try. It's called the Lulu date. And these dates, this is exactly where you find them, from this brand right here, I think. Hmm. Maybe it isn't this brand. I think it is this brand. This is it right here. Maybe I should buy them from these people, but I'm going to go to this this Asian market that has the persimmons, they're going to have these dates probably. These are the best dates, I think, even more than the Majul dates. And it has nothing to do with their methodologies because these are still the premium dates. Um, obviously, they come from a, the right location, right? They come from that part of the world. It's very dry. But also, these dates are just a different variety in the fact that they have a different texture and that grainy crunchiness of the date. These are not as creamy. They still retain that creaminess, but these are extremely crunchy dates. I don't know how to describe it. They have a different texture and it makes them unbelievably good. They're a little smaller. They look exactly like this. And they look exactly like that. And they're out of this world. If you can find these dates, I highly, highly recommend you try them. Um, I need to find myself. If I go to this place and get these persimmons, I'm definitely buying a bunch of these. That's a pretty decent image right there. And I guess when we get some, I'll talk about the differences between these Majul dates and the Lulu date at the next uh, episode of Fruit Talk that we do. I don't even know where you buy these things. Where would you buy them? Crystal Dates Co. This is an Indian supermarket. Hmm. The problem is, if you get them shipped, they're going to probably cost a ton of money. So. Oh. Here's a U UK. Here's the Am an Amazon link, but in the UK. Wow, that's only eleven dollars. What is this? 
We're getting off track here, guys. We're getting off track. This is 2.2 .2 pounds for $11? That's amazing. How much is the shipping, though? Add to cart. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I guess we'll figure this out some other time here, guys. But uh... oh, okay. Here we go. Look at this. Um, here's actually information on the Lulu date. Organic, tasty, cheap price, round shape, fleshy, fleshy nature, dried date. Yeah. Doesn't tell me anything. That doesn't tell me anything. Nope. Go to this link. They're on Amazon on the UK site, but currently unavailable, it says. You gotta know a guy, I think, to get these dates. I don't know what it is. What is the deal here, guys? Anyway, thank you guys here so much <laughs> for watching this episode of Fruit Talk. I appreciate everybody out there who's been listening, all the Patreon subscribers. I know some people actually started using the Amazon store that I set up and have been um, sending me some income, believe it or not, through Amazon. I'm pretty shocked that I'm even getting something substantial out of it, which is crazy. So thank you to those people. Um, thank you to um, everybody who, who bought some bare-rooted trees. And I want to thank everybody who's going to buy some cuttings very soon. We'll have those listed. Thank you guys again for watching. Leave us a little review, comment on the, the video, whatever it is you guys got to do. Hit that subscribe button. Check out our blog. All the stuff, right? All right. We'll see you guys for the next one. Take care, all right? Peace.